Um, okay, so I'm going to start with a puzzle. Um, but before I start with the puzzle, I'm going to present an, what might be characterized as an attractive theory of NPIs. And the distribution of NPI expressions, uh, so negative polarity items like any and ever, greatly, to a great extent mirrors the distribution of another expression in language, namely of a weak expression that is an associate of even. A weak expression is an expression that's entailed by alternatives, and an example is one, which is entailed by the alternatives, two, three, four, and so on. Now, in one, we see that both NPIs and even one type of expressions are you know, infelicitous in upward entailing environments, in positive sentences. So we know that John read any book last year is bad, but also John read even one book last year is bad. And this doesn't you know, depend on context. You know, whatever context you conjure, this is going to sound odd. In downward entailing environments, the behavior, the behavior is the opposite. So John didn't read any book last year is good, and John didn't read even one book last year is also good. And now, again, whatever context you make up, these sentences are going to sound OK. In non monotone environments, we again have parallelism between NPIs and even one expressions. Um, however, this time around, the distribution is context dependent of both and the same for both. So exactly two congressmen read any book last year is OK, but also exactly two congressmen read even one book last year. If we tinker with the sense or tinker with the context, the sense has become unacceptable. So exactly 400 congressmen read any book last year, and exactly 400 congressmen read even one book last year are definitely marked compared to the census in three. So we have this distributional parallelism, which is very suggestive. And this, its suggestive nature has been captured by, by many people. So there's a long tradition in trying to analyze negative polarity items as weak elements that are associated with even. And why is this attractive? It's attractive because, first of all, we know what even means from its distribution elsewhere. So you know, assuming it's a clausal operator, it takes a prejacent and triggers a presupposition that the alternatives are more likely than the prejacent. And you know, the, the main reason why, for, for the attractiveness is that if you assume this meaning for even and assume that NPIs are weak elements, uh, we can explain all the data that we have seen just now. So we get a lot of mileage from these assumptions. So in upward entailing environments, uh, one has a structure like seven for the sense in, in six, or in specifically for the sense in six B. So even uh, adjoins to John read one book last year. The alternatives that John read one book last year are John read two, three, and four books last year. And they're all logically stronger than John read one book last year. So the scalar presupposition triggered by even in this sentence, which is John read one book uh, last year is less likely than John read five books last year, cannot be satisfied because logically weaker propositions cannot be less likely than logically stronger propositions. In downward entailing environments, this changes because even can be interpreted as taking matrix scope. And now the prejacent of even uh, is that John didn't read one book last year which entails all the alternatives. John didn't read two, three, four, five books last year. And since it logically entails them, um, it may very well be less likely than them. So we get John didn't read one book is less likely than the logically weaker uh, proposition that John didn't read five books last year. And this presupposition is almost tautologous. So the sense is going to be good. And it's not going to exhibit any context dependence, because it's going to be almost trivially satisfied. So we explained uh, the facts about upward entailing and downward entailing environments. Now we can also explain facts about their distribution in non-monotone environments. Namely, in these environments, unlike in the previous uh, cases, we get you know, truly contingent scalar presuppositions. So scalar presuppositions that sometimes are satisfied and in other contexts might not be satisfied. So when you have something like exactly two congressmen read even one book last year, the scalar presupposition that is triggered here, if even is interpreted as taking matrix scope, is that exactly two congressmen read one book last year is less likely than exactly two congressmen read five books last year. And intuitively, that's right, because we expect many congressmen to read many books. So it's very surprising that only exactly two congressmen read you know, even one book. So we 
we have a felicitous presupposition and explaining why the sentences in 10 are okay. However, if we play around with the context or the sentence, we get a different presupposition. And for the census in 12, it's given in 13b. And it's exactly 400 congressmen read one book last year is less likely than exactly 400 congressmen read, say, five books last year. And this presupposition cannot be satisfied. Namely, we definitely don't expect that many congressmen to read that many books, or perhaps even a book at all. So the alternatives are now less likely than the prejacent. So the scalar presupposition is odd, explaining the oddness of the sentence. So you know, we get a lot of mileage, so, so we, we should be happy at this point. And so, I, you know, when, whenever you see uh, so far so good, you know that something's going to change pretty soon. And it changes when we look at a slightly uh, greater variety of downward entailing or downward entailing like environments. And if we look at those environments, we see a discrepancy between the distribution of NPIs on the one hand and distribution of even one expressions on the other. So in 14, we ha so these sentences are, you know, come from uh, Leiner Barger's dissertation and um, um, discussed by Irene Heim and many others. So when we have everyone who read any book past the exam, it's an okay sentence, but also everyone who read any book wore blue jeans. So both sentences are acceptable and, you know, we expect them, you know, they're in, in a downward entailing like environment, so everything's good. So in 15, however, we notice a contrast between even one expressions and any. So everyone who read even one book passed the exam. It's okay. We all, uh, you know, if we don't have weird expectations about exams and reading books, then we find it okay. But everyone who read even one book wore blue jeans. This sentence is marked. Unless, you know, we start, you know, thinking what the connection could be between um, wearing jeans and, and reading books and, and so on, in which case it might start sounding better, but there is a clear contrast in 15 that we don't have in 14. Given this data, what have people said? So the standard diagnosis is if NPIs are weak associates of even as the even theory of NPIs purports, then their distribution in 14 is unexpected. No, so it shouldn't be like that. And why shouldn't it be like that? Yeah, well, because it's different from the distribution in 15, so the distribution of even one type of expressions. And this distribution is expected, and we understand it. And so even theory of NPIs you know, cannot be maintained in its you know, simplest form that I presented so far. So this is the standard diagnosis that has been proposed, and uh, usually you know, people then actually follow it. However, today, we're actually going to argue that this is a misdiagnosis uh, and that, in fact, a different diagnosis is the correct one. And it's stated here, so if NPIs are weak associates of even, as the even theory purports, then this, their distribution in 14 is, in fact, expected. You know, so these are the good guys. But it, it, because it's different from the distribution in 15, um, we have to say that the distribution in 15 is unexpected and we don't understand it. So I'm going to try to convince you of that. Uh, and the consequence is that the th even theory of NPIs can be maintained given this data. But we have to say more about you know, census in 15, which we'll do in this talk. And I'll begin by convincing you and myself that uh, the diagnosis that I just presented is right. So we understand NPIs. We don't understand even one. So, you know, st uh, strikingly. And the fact that we don't understand it and the data that we don't understand, I'm going to call the weak associate puzzle. So I'm giving it a name. And then I'm going to try to get a grip on this puzzle. And, you know, I'm going to do that by looking at a different puzzle, at a different distributional puzzle concerning even, namely when it associates with strong elements. And on that, you know, that, on that puzzle, we have a grip. So we know what the explanation of that puzzle is. Namely, it follows from an intricate interaction of even and embedded exhaustification. And because we know that solution, and uh, I'm gonna, after that, I'm going to show you that that solution can be tr naturally transferred to the weak associate puzzle that I just presented. And then we'll come full circle and you know, return to NPIs and see if you know, our resolution of the weak associate puzzle is compatible with our understanding of NPIs on the even theory of NPIs. 
Okay, so let's, let's come to the new diagnosis. So as I have said, NPIs in a variety of environments, um, like in any scenes of conditionals, in restrictors of various quantifi uh, quantifiers, definite descriptions, uh, exhibit a distribution that is not context dependent. So everyone who solved any exercise passed the exam is fine, but also everyone who solved any exercise wore blue jeans, and the same holds for other sentences. So why is this expected? So if the alternatives to NPIs are stronger expressions, as the even theory of NPIs and other theories of NPIs assume, this is expected because the prejacent of even, uh, for example, the prejacent of the sense in 18, everyone who solved any exercise passed the exam is everyone who solved one exercise passed the exam or, or wore blue jeans. Conte in all natural context, contextually entails all the alternatives. So it entails that everyone who solved two exercises passed the exam or wore blue jeans. So if it's contextually stronger than the alternatives, right, its scalar presupposition is going to be extremely weak. You know, it may very well be less likely. So it will be almost tautologous. So we're going to expect these answers to be OK. Right? Because this presupposition it triggers is so weak, it can be easily satisfied. So we're happy. But now what happens with senses where we have even one type expressions? Now we see a contrast that depends on the context. So everyone who solved even one exercise passed the exam is fine, but everyone who solved even one exercise wore blue jeans is odd, unless you have appropriate expectations about wearing blue jeans and, and, and so on. That's the intuition that we have why this sense is odd. But as we have just seen, right, as we have just seen, in all natural contexts, the prejacent, everyone who solved one exercise wore blue jeans, is going to contextually entail the relevant alternatives. Everyone who solved two exercises wore blue jeans. So it's going to be you know, contextually stronger. So it should be you know, less likely than it. So what we get is a almost tautologous presupposition, just like with NPIs. So we expect all these sentences to be good. So we don't expect the markedness that we see in 23. So this is the puzzle. So we understand uh, on the even theory of NPIs the distribution of NPIs, but we don't understand the distribution of overt even that associates with weak elements, which I'm calling the weak associate puzzle. And now, you know, now we're going to start, you know, we're going to focus on, on this weak associate puzzle and going to try to resolve it. And doing that, uh, and you know, we'll do that by positioning it in a bigger paradigm of the distribution of even. And this other part of the paradigm involves um, the so-called strong associate puzzle. Now, even may associate with a strong element that's in a downward entailing environment. In particular, it can associate with strong elements in exactly those environments in which we observe the weak associate puzzle. So in, you know, in restrictor of every, in antecedents of conditionals, in restrictors of definite descriptions, etc. So what is the puzzle? OK, so what is the puzzle? The puzzle is that you know, even everyone who solved all of the exercises failed the exam is good. We replace the main predicate. We get even everyone who solved all of the exercises wore blue jeans is odd. OK, so what, what is unexpected here? It's actually you know, the obverse of what we have seen with the weak associate puzzle. We'll see that this is here unexpected. So why is it unexpected? Because in all of these sentences, the prejacent of even, which is for example, everyone who solved all of the exercises failed the exam or wore blue jeans is now contextually entailed by all the alternatives. So, so it's you know, contextually weaker than the alternatives. So there's no way, there's no way that it could be less likely than them. Right? If, it's, if a sense is contextually weaker than the alternatives, there's no way it can be uh, um, less likely than them. So we have a puzzle, namely we predict all of these sentences to be bad. Namely, they trigger the presupposition in 33. Everyone who solved all of the exercises failed the exam is less likely than everyone who solved some of the exercises failed the exam. Even though we know that in any context in which everyone who solved all of the exercises failed the exam can be used, it's entailed uh, contextually by, by, by the, the alternative. Because some of the senses here are good, namely the senses in 28, you know, we have to do something you know, to, to get this fact. Right? So, so different analysis is mandated. And the analysis that works and gives the exact right results is one that assumes that the, set, the embedded clauses in which the associate of even is located are exhaustified. 
So they have all of the senses have a structure, uh, can have can have a structure given in 34. So here we embed the exhaustification operator in the in the in the restrictor of everyone. So what we get is a set of alternatives given in 34b. First of all, embedding a, an exhaustification operator in the restrictor doesn't change the meaning of the prejacent. It stays the same. Everyone who solved all of the exercises VP, you know, wore blue jeans, you know, failed the exam, whatever. However, it does have an effect on the alternatives. Namely, the alternative now doesn't involve some, but some, but not all. So it is everyone who solved some, but not all of the exercises VP. So the exhaustification is just like only we all know what it is, and so I'm not going to go into that. So what, what's the consequence of this structure? And what's the consequence of the meanings that we get is that now the alternatives are not going to stand in a problematic entailment relation anymore. Specifically, it's not, it doesn't hold that the alternative, everyone who solved some but not all of the exercises failed the exam, contextually entails everyone who solved all of the exercises failed the exam. At most, the opposite holds. Right? So by suspending this problematic contextual entailment relation, right, scalar presuppositions can now be true. And indeed, we see that they are true exactly, or satisfied by the context, exactly in context in which the senses are good. So even everyone who solved all of the exercises failed the exam, which is a good sentence, now triggers the scalar presupposition, which is consistent, which we have seen to be consistent in 37C. Everyone who solved all of the exercises failed the exam is less likely than everyone who solved some, but not all of the exercises failed the exam. And intuitively, this scalar presupposition is correct because you know, our shared assumption is that you know, the more exercises you solve, you know, the better you do in the exam. So we have an explanation of why a sense can be good, even though naively we predicted it to be, to be bad. Namely, we have embedded exhaustification. But you know, in senses in which it is bad, in fact, we see that the scalar presupposition triggered by the sense is also odd. So even everyone who solved all of the exercises wore blue jeans. You know, assuming embedded exhaustification, we have the presupposition everyone who solved all of the exercises wore blue jeans is less likely than everyone who solved some, but not all of the exercises wore blue jeans. And you know, we are not really in a position to say whether this presupposition is right or wrong, because we don't have any expectations. Oh, actually, we are in a position, namely, it's false, because we don't share the right assumptions. So because the scalar presupposition is odd, the sense is going to be odd. If you don't exhaustify, which is always an option, if you don't exhaustify here, you're actually going to get a contradictory scalar presupposition. So it's going to be odd no matter what. It's going to be contradictory because it's going to presuppose that the logically stronger, you know, contextually stronger alternative is less likely than contextually weaker, so you're stuck. So this is our solution of the strong associate puzzle. We have seen, uh, an un, you know, at first glance, unexpected distribution of even in senses in which it associates with a strong element. However, if you assume that embedded exhaustification can be used as a rescue mechanism, you actually predict that it's going to have consistent scalar presuppositions. And in fact, you show that if the sense is odd, the scalar presupposition that it's triggered is not satisfied by the contextual assumptions we share. But if the sense is good, you know, we have seen that the scalar presupposition makes sense. We are willing to, to, to accept it. Um, so what we have done is that uh, if an exhaustification of even is licit, it can apply to rescue and otherwise implicit sense. And we're going to come back to this you know, method that we have used later on. So now you can imagine what's going to happen. So the strong associate, uh, the weak associate. So now we're going back to the weak associate puzzle that we started out with. And building on what we have said about the strong associate puzzle, I'm going to now propose that embedded clauses in all of those sentences are exhaustified. So they have the structure given in 39 and 40. So everyone who solved one exercise, even one exercise past the exam now has the structure um, um, with an embedded exhaust operator, but also ev everyone who solved even one exercise wore blue jeans has the structure with the embedded exhaust operator. And this yields the desired result. So we explain the asymmetry in, in the acceptability judgments by making this assumption. So everyone who solved even one exercise passed the exam now triggers the presupposition of everyone who solved exactly one exercise passed the exam is less likely than everyone who solved one but not many exercises passed the exam. And again, the scalar presupposition, like uh, in, you know, with the strong associate puzzle, 
is correct in a context in which the more exercises you solve, the better you, you know, the more likely you are to pass the exam. So solving just exactly one exercise and passing the exam is much uh, more unlikely than you know, solving more exercises and passing the exam. Okay, and, and now the bad case. In the bad case, the scalar presupposition uh, for the sense everyone who solved even one exercise wore blue jeans is, is everyone who solved exactly one exercise wore blue jeans is less likely than everyone who solved exactly two exercises wore blue jeans. And just as before, we don't really uh, have the tools to evaluate this presupposition as correct or incorrect. At most, it's incorrect because we don't have any right assumptions. We can accommodate those assumptions. You know, nerds wear jeans and so on, but all else being equal, we don't. And we get odd presupposition and an odd sentence. So by making these assumptions, we have explained the unexpected context dependence that we observe with, uh, even, if, with the distribution of even one. So we explain the weak associate puzzle, the contrast in 43, repeated from below. And we did this by arguing that the, you know, that our, you know, that the way to think about this puzzle is as the obverse of the strong associate puzzle. Uh, ob so actually, it means like the other side of the coin. Uh, so the other side of the coin. And so both of them should be thought in about in terms of embedded exhaustification. So 20 more minutes, I see. No, it's, it's okay. Okay, so however, there's a difference between the two solutions, right? So with the strong associate puzzle, Right, we have seen that embedded exhaustification is a rescue mechanism. If you can apply it, if it's listed to apply it, you do apply it. Here, I have to say something you know, stronger, namely that the embedded exhaustification is obligatory. Specifically, I'm saying that if an exhaustification of an associate of even is listed, it must apply. So this you know, might smell to you, you know, of some other principles we have in grammar, you know, if something is possible, it must apply. Short, uh, different kinds of movement operations and so on. So this I would like to understand eventually better. But let me nonetheless elaborate a little bit on the licit part here. So um, when is an exhaustive, if I have time, uh, okay, so I might not have time, but I'm going to do it anyway. So when is an exhaustification licit? An exhaustification is licit if it Trivially, it doesn't you know, lead to a contradiction. And it, it satisfies certain economy conditions. For example, um, allergy to strict downward entailingness that Benjamin and Danny proposed, or perhaps something more sophisticated. So accordingly, um, you don't have exhaustification in the scope of negation. Uh, so what, if this is our characterization of what it means for an exhaustification to be listed, we predict there to be no weak associate puzzle in strictly downward detailing environments. And indeed, uh, this prediction is uh, borne out. So John even didn't need all the mentos is an odd sentence. However, if we had embedded exhaustification, the scalar presupposition, at least what I believe about mentos, uh, is um, plausible. So, and it would be that um, John not eating all of the mentos is less likely than John not eating some of the mentos. And perhaps that makes sense. You know, we tend to eat all of the mentos if we eat them. Or I, or John does that. So we don't obtain no, a strong associate puzzle in strict downward entailing environments because exhaustification does not imply in those environments. And also we don't observe weak associate puzzle. Namely, if you don't exhaustify under negation, you're not going to get the context dependence that we have seen with every. And indeed, this prediction is also borne out. And, and then you know, there are a lot of other predictions, which we might discuss in, in the discussion period. OK, so what we have seen now is that even that associates with weak elements in a variety of downward entailing like environments is good. And this is uh, you know, unexpected, given what we know about even and what we know about weak elements, and given our uh, you know, assumptions about you know, these guys. However, if we assume that you have obligatory, obligatory embedded exhaustification, it can be explained. So if the imbe relevant embedded clauses are obligatorily exhaustified, we exa get exactly those scalar presuppositions that explain the distribution that we see. Um, but indeed, we had to assume that for some reason, um, 
exhaustification is obligatory there. So I, in, in the characterization of the obligatoriness of exhaustification, I, I, I stated first the licitness uh, conditions, when, when can you apply it? Uh, but I, you, know, you might notice that I didn't say why it must apply. And I have some thoughts about that and that involve focus uh, association, but it's all very vague. Um, so let's come back to negative polarity items that we started out with. Do we still understand their distribution given our, you know, given our resolution of the weak associate puzzle? Uh, you know, did, do we lose something big elsewhere? And I'm going to say that yes, that tentatively we still understand it. If we make an you know, a natural assumption, or perhaps not so natural assumption, about negative polarity items, the Gennaro made, namely that they trigger domain alternatives. So the alternatives to a negative polarity item like any are existential quantifiers whose domain is a subdomain of, of, of the domain of any. So this has been also proposed by Manfred and, and others. Um, so given this assumption, you know, Gennaro taught us that exhaustification of any is contradictory. So if you uh, exhaustify any given these alternatives, you're going to get meaning like in 49, uh, John read some book in D, but he read no book in any subset D prime of D. This is on a very naive theory of exhaust, but good enough. Um, so, so we have an illicit exhaustification. So because the exhaustification of the embedded clause of any is illicit, it doesn't need to apply. So the alternatives are now the ones that we had before, where the prejacent is you know, stronger than, than the alternative, so it may very well be less likely than them. And so the scalar presupposition um, described in 52 and 53 may be satisfied, and we observe no context dependence. So effectively, yeah, exhaustification need not apply in those environments. And, and I sketched one way of thinking why not. There might be others. Uh, however, it does raise a prediction. It raises a prediction if you have an NPI that might be exhaustified, you would observe context dependence. So, and indeed, some NPIs do exhibit context dependence, and this is again from Leine Barger, or a variant of examples from Leine Barger. Everyone who invested the red sand got rich, it's okay, but everyone who invested the red sand wore blue jeans is odd. And the oddness that, you know, we, you know, if we try to pinpoint the intuition where the oddness comes from, is it's from the fact that, you know, investing money and wearing jeans is not related and therefore the sense is odd. Um, so minimizers exhibit context dependence. So how, how does that work with what we have said so far? Um, it works if we again follow Gennaro and others in assuming that uh, minimizers, unlike you know, any and ever, induce scale alternatives and, and no other assumptions. So if we just assume that, right? if we just assume that, then their exhaustification should be licit. So, for example, in 56, John invested a red cent, which doesn't have even, so, so this, uh, this is actually bad, but we'll see. But just for illustration, John invested a red cent. It has the meaning John invested some amount of money, but I don't know, not a significant amount of money or, or something with degrees. And this is, is consistent. So, so this is illicit exhaustification. So if we assume that the exhaustification of min minimizers is illicit, then it can apply in the environments in which we have looked at, and so everyone who invested the red sand got rich. Now, with the embedded exhaustification, has the presupposition of everyone who invested some amount of money, but not a great amount of money, got rich, is less likely than everyone who invested a great amount of money, got rich. And this is an intuitively you know, plausible assumption, given you know, the more money you invest, the more likely you are to get rich, perhaps. However, when you replace the main predicate with wear blue jeans, everyone who invested the red sand wore blue jeans, which is odd, you get a scalar presupposition that's going to be odd in the same way that we have seen oddness before, namely, it's going to require us to evaluate a contingent scalar presupposition involving you know, investing money and wearing blue jeans, and we're not able to make sense of the scalar presupposition that we get. So given this assumption of minimizers being inducing different alternatives, which comes from Gennaro, who, who crucially capitalized in his earlier versions of the, the, the book on, on the difference of um, alternatives that Danny has and, and, and these guys have, we can explain the context-dependent distribution of minimizers 
uh, which cannot be explained if you don't assume something, or it's not obvious how it would be explained if you don't assume something like exhaustification, because embedded exhaustification gives you the exactly right results that you would want. However, you know, this assumption that the exhaustification of minimizers is licit, you know, is not, is not a trivial assumption. And in fact, many people have assumed uh, that, you know, you cannot exhaustify these guys. So, you know, did they trick you to, uh, or trick you too much? Um, I think you can still make the theory work even if you assume that, you know, the alternatives are, you know, the really, you know, trivial alternatives that I assumed here. You know, just, you know, like alternatives for one, more or less the same. So I think you can make it work if, if you make two additional assumptions, which might not be outrageous and which might have independent support from what we know about these guys. Namely, that even also triggers an additive presupposition and that you have some theory of intervention. If you do that, so we have already seen how we deal with the data in 59. Uh, in 60, where we observe no context dependence, we explain in the same way before. We can't exhaustify in this environment. But now we can also say why John invested the red sand is bad. You know, you have exhaustification, you have additivity, so you have a clash. So these senses are still not going to work. But also some boys invested a red sand is not going to work, even though you can have separation, the stop sign is following me. Uh, but, but in this case, you have an intervention effect. You know, this is a very rudimentary, you know, possibly false start uh, of a, a way of looking at minimizers that builds on, on the intuitions that Gennaro had that they induce scale alternatives. OK, so we have explained the distribution of any. We have uh, seen that it follows that it's compatible with what we have said about the weak associate puzzle simply by, by you know, stipulating that the exhaustification of any um, does not need to apply. And we have seen that if you have scale, uh, negative polarity items that have different alternatives, you might get context dependence. And this concludes the talk. Uh, so we have seen, I started out with um, a standard argument, again, one, one standard argument against treating NPIs um, as weak associates of even. We have seen that this argument is actually not an argument against the analysis, but rather um, a motivation to look at the distribution of weak, even one expressions more carefully. And we have uh, seen that we have tried to propose why this puzzle doesn't obtain with NPIs, because their exhaustification is not possible unless they induce a particular kind of alternatives. And many predictions and questions are raised by this that need further exploration. And, and as you can see, you know, this has fingerprints of Gennaro all over. And I forgot in the beginning to congratulate you on, on your birthday. So, so, yeah, questions. Sigrid? Or, or, or Someone else, I, so may, I might have, okay, I, I, may I select who, <laughs> yes. I have a question about um, the logical forms that you propose that have both even and exhaustification. Yes. Maybe you could look at um, one of them. Yeah, so um, uh, which one, uh, like this? Yeah, that one. So um, it looks as if um, the alternative the alternatives um, triggered by one want to associate first with um, the exhaustification and then with the even. Yes. And I'd just like to know how, how exactly you'd like to do that. Um, so I could use, yeah, um, so before coming to the technical part, let me just highlight, the, so, so Sigrid is actually uh, pushing me on, on, on a property that I'm assuming ex exhaust has namely that it allows alternatives to pass through. So, you know, the same op two operators are associating with the same object, you know, and they're nested. So this apparently, as, as Sigrid has shown, does not hold for at least many other operators or configurations of focus-sensitive particles. So crucially, I'm assuming that this is possible. And the implementation might simply be, uh, like, I, I think it's compatible with, uh, like, Walt's th like any theory that, is, that allows for multiple fo focus association. But indeed, it's a crucial assumption, but it's not an assumption that, you know, is, it's an assumption that people, you know, who assume the grammatical theory, you know, have been making uh, a while, uh, and indeed, 
it's not a trivial one. But, but it's needed. So if also for the treatment of free choice that Danny assumes and so on, you have to have um, you know, double association with a single focused element. Now, yeah. Um, why is this possible and not possible with perhaps overt only? Um, I can't provide an answer for that. Yeah. Though, though interestingly, uh, it, there has been discussion of concessive conditionals in which you have sentences like, uh, even if John read just one book and so on, in which on the surface you might have association of just and even with, so, uh, with uh, one. So there might be something special about exclusives with some properties that they allow this percolation of alternatives through them that perhaps, again, doesn't... Um, but yeah, this is a. Yeah. 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 Is, it all, is it ended? The answer? Can I ask you something? Yeah. Uh, th this was the very nice. never ended, but go uh, okay, ahead. Yeah. Uh, this was very nice. It's really a ba basic question. I was wondering so, if I understood correctly, in the end, your theory of MPI that you're saving here is one in which, when you have a sentence like, everyone who solved any exercise passed the exam, is one in which you have even there, a covert even, right? But. It seems to me there is a difference if you have overt even, and probably you thought about this, but everyone who even solved any exercise past the exam seems to me a little odd. You would probably say everyone who even solved any didn't pass the exam. So I see a contrast so, between... So I think there's a... So th this, is an, you know, this is another research question. It might already be, you know, if you look at um, Gennaro's footnotes, you might find it there. It's, it's a puzzle about... It's a puzzle about any which we assume associates with these guys, you know, uh, any, actually it's a covert even that associates with it. But there seems to be a constraint against, um, I think the VP even cannot associate with any at all. And to that I also don't have a question, uh, an answer why you can't have an overt even taking over in, in oh, okay, so these are simplified representations, uh, so it should be covert, but but yeah, so it's a it's a real puzzle, and you know, um, you could you yeah, you know one could weave many different stories why that's not possible, but uh, maybe one shouldn't here. Uh, but let me just point out that the judgments I think change if you don't have the VP even, but that you have if you have an even on on the NP. So uh, um, every boy who read even. Maybe not, but, uh, but, uh, but I've heard reports that there might be differences between, in German, uh, perhaps, uh, but, but there might be an asymmetry uh, with respect to where in the configuration even is located. So, so the story, the answer to your question might be, you know, you know I, I could point to a, a you know, syntactician and, and tell him to tell you the story. But, but yeah, both very good questions, yeah. So, hi. Benjamin. Um, so I love the talk. And I have a question which may just uh, be a clarification question. It could be that I really missed something at some point. So, mm -hmm. um, so what happens in, in, in the cases, in, in the strong, in the you know, first puzzle, is that you, you need exhaustification to create somehow non monotonic context yeah. so that the um, presupposition of even can, in principle, be satisfied, but then it creates a context dependence. Yes. yes. Then, so, so I have my basic question is. Why couldn't you say, you know, suppose it's expected that John has an enormous number of children. Then why couldn't you say John has even one child? Meaning, uh, with, with exhaustification, so with exhaustification, that would mean, you know, he has exactly one. And that's more surprising than having ten, for instance. Yeah. And so this presupposition would be that, mm -hmm. right? Yes. The, you guys are very good. So obviously that, you know... You, it, your association with Gennaro is clear. Um, so this, I, I would like to suggest that it somehow relates to the notion of when embedded exhaustification... No, sorry. Uh, it's like in, uh, in our treatment of minimizers, right? I suggest that, that there's more to even than what I have said so far. So just for your example, and then you could start coming up with yeah. different ones, is the, the assumption that even triggers an additive presupposition Right, like Elena Guertoni and others have assumed, would account for your data because you would get 
uh, scalar presupposition that might be right, but you would also have the additive presupposition uh, that, you know, some the other, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, so that uh, John read exactly one, uh, has an exactly one child, but he has exactly two child. Uh, then, you know, then your repost could be that, what about if you have some boy? Exactly. Uh, and here, I would like to, you know, point to Gennaro's suggestion of how one should think about a theory of intervention, or intervention effects, or, or point to Sigrid, or, you know, so to, to other people who have worked on that. So, if we assume that the cents, like some boy uh, invested even one cent or something like that, uh, the representation would have to be that even takes scope above uh, sum and you have exhaustification below. So there's no clash between additivity which is not, and, 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 and exhaustification because it can be true that some boy invested exactly one cent but, but, but um, some, other some other boy invested a greater amount of money, it's fine and scalar presupposition might be right if you play with the context. But you have an intervening operator sum which is, which you know, if we assume that if even associates with something in the scope of a scalar part item, the alternatives of some are activated. Now you would have the alternative every boy invested exactly one red cent, and, and this is logically stronger, so you would get a contradictory scalar presupposition. So um, this, of course, raises many predictions also about distribution of even, uh, which might actually bring us back to um, Sigrid's question. If, if this is the theory of intervention with focus, then you know, there's a lot of data that would need to be investigated whether, whether it's right. Yes. 